Hello, YouTube! Welcome to part six already of Dragon Age Origins with a Therapist. I appreciate, as always, that you have made it this far. And I hope that our playthrough tonight is just as fantastic as the ones leading up to it have been. I'm excited to see what we have in store for us here at Red Cliff. As always, leave a thumbs up on the stream. Follow all the links down in the description. Leave a comment if you feel so inclined. And join us on Twitch sometime at 9.30 p.m. Pacific Time, Tuesday through Sunday. Would love to say hello. But I appreciate you making this far. You rock. Let's see what we got tonight. All right, so we talked to Ban Tegan. That's all taken care of. Let's talk to a few folks in here, see what's going on. Let right. us pray. Blessed art thou who exists in the Maker's sight. Blessed art thou who seeks his forgiveness. Blessed art thou who seeks his return. Blessed is the prophetess, his daughter, sacrificed to the Holy Flame. May the chant reach the Maker's ears and tell him of our contrition. All these little scared Why kids. Father returned yet? They're... They're gone. Dear boy, gone on a long trip. When will they be back? I miss them. Be brave, young man. Your parents would want that. We need you here to protect the rest of us. Yes? I guess I can do that. There's a good lad. In the morning, we'll look for your parents. In the morning. It is really important to be honest with kids when it comes to the death of their parents. People cringe at this idea. It's a moment where a lot of adults will try to protect a child because they believe that a child can't handle it. Death is a harsh reality of life. It is something that we all have to contend with. And when we know, in this case, we don't know for a fact that these parents are gone. I'm going to assume that they are. I'm going to assume that they're dead. If you know that they're dead, you've got to tell the kids that. You have to be honest. You go as developmentally appropriate as you can in terms of explaining death and how it works. But sometimes people will create these like stories and these white lies to try to soften the blow. Reality is, if a kid's parents are dead, they're dead. So the kid needs to know that they are dead. There's never a great time to talk to people about death. But if a child's parents are dead, you got to talk to them about that. Same thing with anybody else in the family. Like Death is not something that we should be shying away from talking about. If a kid gets afraid when you talk about death and has questions, you answer it confidently. You talk about it casually. You say it's part of life. It's a very hard thing. When people die, they go away, as far as we know, forever, or whatever your, your religious doctrine says, or whatever. But it means that they're not coming back. And I don't expect you to fully understand that, but it's the reality that we have to work with. And you just stay communicative with them. You answer their questions. You recognize and validate their emotions. It's not an easy conversation to have. No adult wants to have a conversation with kids about death. But you've got to do it. You have to lean into that. You can't make it about your adult anxiety there. Never and forever are rough words, but as it relates to death... It's the truth. We have a lot of language we use to try to soften the blow of how deeply affecting to us death is, but... I fear most for the children. They are so frightened. It breaks my heart. Yep, me too, man. It's tough. Interesting how people focus on kids and their innocence and... Not on the fact that, like, adults are affected scared, by this, Mother. too. When are the bad men coming? Soon, darling. Don't worry. Everything will be all right. I want to go home. 
Where's father? Why can't we go home? I already told you. Father is outside defending the village from the bad men. We must stay here and be brave. Can you do that? I... I guess so. I think kids don't understand the idea of permanence until a certain age, right? Don't mistake permanent with object permanence. Object permanence starts somewhere between 8 to 12 months old. Uh, object permanence is a kid's understanding that an object exists even when they don't see it. The, the concept of something being permanent is different. Death being a permanent loss of life is different. So, yeah, no, it's a good question. And, Sean, that's a good question for the questions for Dr. Mick channel in Discord. Good day. You're a Grey Warden, right? Were you in Ostagar? In the Kokari Wilds? My husband and son went there to bring the Chant of Light to the Chastened. But I haven't heard from them since. Are you a Jetta? I don't know what a Jetta is, but... I am. You've heard of me? Just a hunch? Take care? I'm sorry to burden you with my mourning. Make her be with you. Uh, that was a weird interaction. Demonic possession. <laughs> Why do demons seek to possess the living? History claims they are malevolent spirits, the first children of the Maker, angry at their creator for turning from them and jealous of those creations he considered superior. They stare across the veil at the living and do not understand what they see, yet they know they crave it. They desire life. They pull the living across the veil when they sleep and prey on their psyche with nightmares. Whenever they can, they cross the veil into our world and possess it outright. We know that any demon will seek to possess a mage and upon doing so will create an abomination. Most of the world does not know, however, that the strength of an abomination depends entirely on the power of the demon that possesses the mage. This is true, in fact, of all possessed creatures. One demon is not the same as any other. Demons can, for instance, be classified. Enchanter Brahm's characterization of demons into that portion of the psyche they primarily prey upon is held since the Tower Age. According to Brahm, the weakest and most common of demons are those of rage. They are the least intelligent and most prone to violent outbursts against anything living. They expend their energies quickly, the most powerful of them exhibiting great strength and occasionally the ability to generate fire. Next are the demons of hunger. In a living host, they become cannibals and vampires, and within the dead, they feed upon the living. Theirs are the powers of draining, both of life force and of mana. Next are the demons of sloth, the first on Brahm's scale that are capable of true intelligence. In its true form, this demon is known as a shade, a thing which is nearly indistinct and invisible, for such is sloth's nature. It hides and stalks, unaware, and when confronted, it sows fatigue and apathy. Demons of desire are amongst the most powerful and are the ones most likely to seek out the living and actively trick them into a deal. These demons will exploit anything that can be coveted, wealth, power, lust, and they will always end up getting far more than they give. A desire demon's province is that of illusions and mind control. Strongest of all demons are those of pride. These are the most feared creatures to loose upon, to loose upon the world. Masters of magic and in possession of vast intellect, they are the true schemers. It is they who seek most strongly to possess mages, and will bring other demons across the veil in numbers to achieve their own ends. Although what they might be has never been discovered. A greater pride demon brought across the veil would threaten the entire world. From the Maker's First Children by Bader, Senior Enchanter of Ostwick, 812 Blessed. Damn. Gotta go for pride. Uh, let's go. I need more strength. Must get more strength. And I got one little thingy to use to level up. Shield cover while in this mode of war. Shield provides greater chance of deflecting missile attacks. Two-handed. I don't want two-handed. Dual weapon. Character has become more proficient fighting with two weapons. Now deals close to normal damage. Uh, see, I don't want any of that. I need, I need this stuff. We're gonna, we're gonna wait on that. 
I would agree, Christian. Red Robin, thank you for the two months. Hope you're having an awesome time. Thank you for doing everything you do. I always feel supported and cared for when I'm in your stream, and you make me feel like a normal person. Red Robin, I appreciate the kind words, and thank you for the sub, friend. I love that we can just go to bookshelves and, like, get books and learn stuff. It's great. Caitlin. Sorry. Am I bothering you? I'll, I'll try to be more quiet. Um... Good, I'll leave you to your sniveling. <coughs> uh, you're not bothering me. I shouldn't be such a crybaby. With mother gone now, I have to be brave. I just... I can't help myself. I'm so frightened. Those... Those things dragged my mother away. I don't know what happened to her, but... I hear her screaming all the time. Everywhere. And now my brother Bevan, he, he ran off. I, I don't know where he is. I'm so scared they got him too. Fear is a legitimate emotional experience. And by virtue of being an emotional experience, it is a physiological experience. Fear is adaptive. Fear is created as a way often to get us to do something that will help us survive. It's a expanded and more intense version of anxiety. When we hear her say, I shouldn't be such a crybaby. I hate to burden you. Those are things that she has learned as judgments about a person who experiences fear. And unfortunately, we see this all the time. Because fear is such a powerful experience, most people experience it as controlling them. And that's by design. Just by the way that it affects the brain and the way that it then affects what we want to do with our body. And so then we conceptualize people who experience fear as being weak. The fact of the matter is, the only difference between people who are weak and who are strong as it relates to fear, if we put it into a binary, is that people who are strong are people who acknowledge and honor the fear and decide what to do with it. And one of the ways that you can assist a person in changing their orientation to fear is to validate it for them rather than tell them that they are weak or out of control for experiencing it. Experiencing fear is one thing. Behaving in a reckless way as the result of fear is what causes problems. It's the same thing with anger. So what all of us need to do when we experience fear is recognize it for what it is. Create meaning around it. Put it in context. And then choose how we act in relation to it. People who work to understand their fear rather than suppress it and throw it away are people who are better able to engage in the world while afraid. And being afraid is a perfectly reasonable way to respond to mass amounts of uncertainty and a lack of safety, which is what's happening right now in this town that we're in. It's really a shame to see her then project what she's learned about her fear here. But it's there for a reason. People can create fear in their minds through perpetuating what ifs and through ruminating on certain things that are not useful to ruminate on. But that's part of what we're talking about here when we talk about reorienting yourself to fear, changing the way that you respond to it, changing your entire meta conceptualization of it goes a really long way. Um... Why would he run off? Do you know? How do you take fear out of the driver's seat and turn it to the GPS voice when you can choose to follow the, the advice off? So, fear is never actually in the driver's seat. Like, that's all, that's part of it. Like, it's a good question, but like, fear doesn't drive the bus. Our emotions are designed evolutionarily as a way for us to to become conscious about things that are in the environment. It's all about survival. So fear is something that might show up and be really loud. It's kind of like the drunk belligerent person that gets into the passenger seat of your car and won't shut up. 
right? But ultimately, it's not in the driver's seat. You are. And so one of the first reconceptualizations of fear and severe anxiety and stuff like that is for us to get into a place where we start to realize you're always in the driver's seat. It's just a matter of certain emotional experiences are a lot louder than others and try to convince you that they are in the driver's seat when they are not. So that's where we have to sit with it. We understand it. We build the stress tolerance around it. We allow it to show up when it's going to show up. And ideally in a safe place like a therapy room, it can be really great because then a therapist can help a person reconceptualize that, think about it differently, have a new narrative, respond to it differently. But you have to plan for it. What a lot of people wait to do is they think they have to wait until they're scared again in order to like change the way they orient themselves to it. No, think about it when you're not scared. What, it, what tends to happen to me when I'm scared? What's my autopilot? What would I rather it be? Make a concrete alternative. Practice it. Hear yourself say that narrative out loud. Like, you got to practice stuff when you're not experiencing things, which is something that a lot of people, I think, don't realize either. That, like, a lot of mental health treatment and a lot of, like, just healthy mental pathways are the result of people who prepare more so than just consistently react to what it is that's happening to them. That's a good question. All right. Where would he run off? Do you know? He said something about saving mother. He's just a little boy. He doesn't understand she's gone. If he has foolishly run off, then he is no doubt dead. You should get used to that fact. Nice. Maybe you want to kick her in the head while you're at it. Shall we comfort her with lies? If she is to face death, better she face it honestly. I hope he didn't try to go to the castle. Oh, that would be awful. Morgan's not wrong. But I will say that, like, Morgan could use a little bit of tact, I think. Um, my guess is that if she brings to light, like, just the pure reality of the what if of this kid being dead, that's not going to help anything. If the person that the kid is looking for is dead, we can, we can certainly hold that as a reality. And again, this kind of ties to the importance of what I was talking about 15 minutes ago. Which is that when a kid doesn't understand death, in this circumstance, the kid's not thinking, oh, this is a permanent, uh, this is a permanent thing that, what the hell am I trying to say here? It's not a permanent stat, status. So the kid goes running off thinking that he can go save the person, right? Like, you've got to help the kid understand, no, this is permanent. There is nothing you're going to do that's going to bring this person back, aside from necromancy in a world like this, but... So the kid ran off partially because he doesn't understand it. So we need to be real about that. But Morgan kind of getting into this like, well, your kid's probably dead because he ran after it. I don't know that that's particularly useful here. Um, have you tried looking for him? I went to her house. It's by the square. He wasn't there. I searched the rest of the village too. I called and I called, but he never answered. I, I wonder if he ran off into the woods. I'm so worried. Without me, he has nobody. I will look for him, but I can't promise I'm going to find him. You will. Thank you so much. Please find him. Silence, girl. Do you want the children to hear you? But night is coming. The monsters will return, and we sit here and wait for them. We have no choice. We must pray and hope for the Maker's compassion. Um, yeah, yeah, Maker, thanks for making this mess. Hope you'll clean it up. Is this where humans keep all their wisdom? Your behavior makes much more sense to me now. What does that mean, Sten? I can't believe that fool Dwin just barricaded himself into his house. Selfish bastard. You know, we don't have the men. I can't believe how cowardly and selfish Twin is being. Each night. Oh, I'm telling the missus he doesn't deserve her blackberry tart anymore. What's up, monster? Hey, we gotta run King's Fall soon, bud. Surprise attack before the sun goes down. Yes, sir. What should we do until then? Pray and hope for a miracle. Oh, is that the guy who voices Zaid? What's up, Murdoch? So you're the Grey Warden, are you? I heard they all died with the king. Oh my god, that's all I can hear is Zaid. <laughs> um You heard
heard wrong, man. So you say. A damn Kunari could walk up and say he was a Grey Warden. I wouldn't know the difference. That much is clear. We <laughs> aren't gonna turn aside anyone who wants to help, though. Don't take me for being an ingrate or nothing. Well, we do want to help however we can. You can trust us. Name's Murdoch, mayor of what's left of the village, providing we aren't all killed and hauled off to the castle tonight. Uh, we gotta instill some hope here, man. People are starting to slip down into the bowels of reality, and while that's okay... Uh... I don't know that that's really gonna inspire people to do what they can to survive. Have faith, good man. We'll defeat this evil together. I... I hope you're right. I've been trying to hold us together, but it isn't easy. Anyhow, you're here, and they tell me you're in charge. What can I... I got some questions. Oh? Ask away. Where can I get some supplies, good man? Hmm. If you want weapons and such, you'd go to the blacksmith, but there isn't much left there. Is there anywhere to actually buy or sell anything? Uh... Commerce isn't exactly our biggest concern right now, but you might want to speak to Lloyd at the tavern. I wouldn't trust him, though. What's going on here? Don't rightly know. We heard the Arl was sick and getting worse, but after a while we heard nothing at all. A few folks went up to the castle to see what was going on. They couldn't get in. Nobody was there, not a soul. And then those horrid creatures attacked the village. They were everywhere. People dying. It was awful. Good thing Ban Tegan was here. You know anything about the Arl's illness? No. I know the Arlesa sent the knights out for a cure. You can ask Sir Perth about it. He was one of them. I want to discuss something else. All right. Uh, how's morale around here? Morale's about what you'd expect. These men aren't soldiers. They're villagers defending their homes, and they're frightened. It would help if we had decent equipment. There weren't enough swords in Owen's shop, and the men's armor is nearly falling off. I don't think we're in any shape to fight. We'll do our best, of course, but, well... I have my doubts. I just hope I'm alive tomorrow morning. Me too, man. Is there anything I can do to help? We need what little armor and weapons we got repaired, and quickly, or half of us will be fighting without either. Owen's the only blacksmith who can do it, but the stubborn fool refuses to even talk. If we're to be ready for tonight, we'll need that crotchety bastard's help. Is there a reason he refuses to talk to you? His daughter, Valena, is one of the Alessa's maids, so he hasn't heard from her since this whole business started. He demanded we attack the castle, break down the gate, and force our way in. I said it was impossible, but he wouldn't listen. He's locked himself in the smithy now. I can't force him to do repairs. He said he'd rather die first. Huh. Uh, well... Is there nobody else that can do the repairs, or are we stuck with this guy? Not by nightfall, and not well enough that I'd be happy to test it in combat. If there were others, don't you think I'd ask them? That's fair. I'll talk to him, but no promises, my dude. I'd appreciate it. If he doesn't help, he'll die like the rest of us. What good will that do anyone then? It will do us no good, sir. I understand that. Oy vey, man. Okay, so, blacksmith. If I was a blacksmith, where in this town would I be? There's the Chantry, the tavern, and the smithy. The smithy appears to be right here, so let's just go in there and see what we can... Uh, hell. Go oh, smithy. This is a... Mighty confusing area here. Caitlin's home. A nice little humble abode here. 
When you approach the dresser, something moves inside. You hear a short, surprised intake of breath and then silence. Uh, oh boy. Someone there? Go away. This isn't your home. A small human. I say burn it out. Oh, Easy, Sten. What are you doing? All right, I'll come out. What up, dude? Please, don't hurt me. I'll go back to the Chantry if you want. I didn't mean any harm. Uh, alright, so... This kid is rightly scared, has no idea who I am. If he hasn't seen me before, and particularly if he hasn't seen Sten, he is likely to panic. So we're going to be nice and chill. We're going to ask him some easy questions. We're going to ease him in here. When you're talking to a kid, one of the best things you could do is get on their level. Something a lot of adults don't realize is that you're very big to a child. Like, when kids have to turn their head up to look at you, that is a power move on your part, whether you intend it to be or not. So one of the best ways to take some fear out of a kid in a strange situation is to get down on their level so that you're eye to eye. It neutralizes that physical power dynamic. And then you start, you can say things like, here's my name, what's yours? You ask easy questions. It allows them to kind of open up, feel a little bit safer here. So what's your name, man? It's Bevan. My, my sister is Caitlin. She's probably at the Chantry looking for me. What are you doing in there? I, I can't tell you. It's a secret. Look, man, I get it. You're like 13. Doesn't matter if there's demons coming out of the ground. I get it, man. Sometimes you find a raging clue. You think maybe you get it into the into the wardrobe. You know, get it done. I get it, man. Not a lot of privacy during times of war. I get it. Maybe I could help you, man. You could. All right, I guess. I just. Father said I could have his sword when I grew up. It was grandfather's, and grandfather was a great dragon slayer. I thought, if I was brave like Grandfather, I could use his sword and kill the bad people who took Mother. Well, that is a noble idea, young lad. And I could certainly appreciate that. You know what? I think the very thought of, the, of that is brave, just to think about that. We gotta be real, man. We gotta be realistic here. But I admire the sentiment. You had the right idea. You are indeed very brave, my friend. Thank you, sir. But the sword is too heavy for me. I guess I'm not as strong as someone like you. Not yet, but you will be. You'll grow up eventually. That doesn't help us now. <laughs> Caitlin says everyone's going to die tonight. Jeez, no wonder you tried to find the sword. That's very likely, but there's nothing. Jeez. Not if I'm here to help, they won't. Really? You must be very brave. I wish I was like you. You are like me. Where's the sword, big guy? In the chest. In Mother's room. Father gave me a key, but I'm not supposed to give it to anyone. I could use that sword to help the village, man. But I can't give it to you. It was Father's. Caitlin would be so mad if I did. Perhaps I could help you and your sister in return? You could? Maybe you could... give my <laughs> sister money? She said if we had money, we'd be alright. Even if Mother is dead. All right, I'll talk to her about it. Oh, all right. Here's the key. I hope you use it to kill a lot of those bad people. I should go back to the Chantry. Good luck. Thanks, my dude. Much obliged. This sword better not be garbage. Oh, I gotta open the chest. There is the chest. 
Going. Okay. Green blade. Ooh, it is good. All right. Green blade is now mine. I like that. Now let's give Sten. Maybe this is better. Give him Oathkeeper. Hell yeah. Atta boy. Cautionary Tales for the Adventurous. It was then that he realized he wasn't alone. The abandoned camp in front of him was unbelievably welcoming, like a mirage. The fire felt like a warm hand grabbing his heart. It reminded him of a previous life so long ago when he was happy. Running on the sunflower fields with his boy, the sun on his face, laying next to the fireplace with his beautiful wife in his arms. He felt a sharp pain in his heart. His thoughts shifted to that fateful day when everything changed. Blood was everywhere. He held the body of his dead wife in his arms. Around him, the ashes of his burned house felt like snow. The stench was terrible. It smelled like darkspawn. He grabbed his axe, touched the icy cold hands of his boy, and left. He would kill them. He would kill them all. The pain in his heart was unbearable. He opened his eyes and saw the second most terrifying thing he would see in his life. A shadowy wraith leaning over him, leeching his life away. Around him, the camp was gone, replaced by something familiar, almost peaceful. Bones, death, and despair. He wondered if all his life had been an illusion, if he'd ever had a family. For a brief moment, he felt relief. You can't lose something you've never had. But being this close to death brought clarity. He knew it was real. Everything else was the illusion. You could see a smile on his torn face. He'd been waiting for this moment for a long, long time. He lifted his weak arms, grasped the demon's face, and kissed it. It felt like kissing a cloud made of sand and dust. Suddenly, all sorrow left him, and with it, the last bit of life he had. Before his limp body hit the ground, it was all over. He was finally free. From Cautionary Tales for the Adventurous by Brother Ramos of Gilharam, 794 Storm. That was the second most terrifying thing he'd ever seen. Nope. Okay. Alright, I gotta do sword out of this. I'm happy. Uh, let's go back to the Chantry and talk to Caitlyn. That's probably a good call. Huh. God, I have to sneeze. It won't come out. Bevan said you were the one who found him. I can't possibly repay you. Uh, wow, Bioware. No. Um, just stay safe. The Maker sent you. I just know it. Thank you again. Good enough. I'm not gonna rat the kid out. Okay. Now I want to go to the blacksmith. Why do you always go on about how stupid I am? I'm not stupid, am I? What do you wish oh, of God me? damn it. I didn't want to click on her. Ah, I wanted to see what they were going to say. Uh, Dios mio. Okay. Blacksmith. The smithy. Why am I having a hard time? God damn it. Oh, well. Maybe we'll get the dialogue again. Yeah. 
Yes. Locked chest. Go away. Curse you. Leave me in peace. You've already taken everything out of my stores. There's nothing left. Uh, all right, we're gonna slow play this, I think. Who are you? I'm the bloody blacksmith, and this is my shop. There's nothing of interest here anymore, whoever you are. So you best move along. I'd like to speak with you. Is there any way I could come in? Mm. All right, all right. Let me undo the locks. All I ask is that you don't make any trouble. Hey, that was nice. That worked out. I'm a little surprised he softened that quickly, but... Yes. Somebody's been drinking. So I let you in. You wanted to talk. Now we're talking. Mind telling me who you are? You can call me Mick. Funny, you didn't sound like an elf through the door. Can't say I expected that. Anyhow, my name's Owen, though you might already know that. Care to join me as I get besotted? Or is there something in particular you wanted? When people drink alcohol as a coping mechanism, they usually do it for one of two reasons. Either to feel things or to get away from feeling things. I don't necessarily know which one it is for this guy, but if I had to guess, it's probably to get away from feeling things given what we were told about his family. Drinking alcohol is what we call a maladaptive coping strategy. Which essentially means that it is a coping strategy. It's something that many people turn to in times of stress, in times of high or low emotional intensity. But the reason that it's maladaptive is because it causes problems on the back end. So you might have where a person becomes dependent on a substance. They start to believe that that substance is the only thing that's going to allow them to accomplish whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish. But the most important thing is that what happens is a person builds a relationship to alcohol in times of stress that is consistent and reliable, which humans really want. So if things have not been particularly consistent or reliable for this guy, but alcohol is, him turning to alcohol in the time where he is feeling a lot of stress maybe as a means to get away from it and put distance between himself and his emotional experience makes complete sense. So what's difficult is that a lot of times when people are using alcohol as a coping strategy, the tendency is for others outside of it to say, well, just stop. But the reason that's hard for people to do, aside from chemical dependency, is because their relationship to it is so strong and it is far more predictable than it might be to the other humans in their life or other coping strategies that they may have otherwise developed. It's what makes things like alcoholism so difficult to work through. It's not just a biological process. There is a psychological process that happens as well. I'm not suggesting that this guy is an alcoholic, but when we, it's a great opportunity for me to talk about it that there is drink to feel, drink to suppress, and usually people fall in one of those two categories. All right, is there something particularly particular you wanted? Uh, I'm going to try to warm up to him a little bit here. Uh, what do you know about what's going on? You mean, why are these creases attacking the village? Obviously, something wicked corrupts the castle. My daughter used to tell me the Arlesa was up to something, hiding things from her husband. I told Velena she was imagining things. But maybe the Arlesa was involved in something. Blood magic, maybe. What do you know about the Arlesa? Only that she's an Orlesian girl from beyond the Western Mountains. 
Far too young for our all. That's what I say. And too proud and it's strong from the sounds of it. You think the Arlesa made the Arl sick? I'd never make such accusations. But maybe if she was using foul magic, then maybe she just did it that. What else did she say? She thought the Arlesa was having an affair with some tutor she hired for the boy, Connor. I never listened much to her talk about it, though I wish now I had. It doesn't matter anyway. She's lost to me, and I can't do anything about her warnings now. Oh, man. So essentially what this guy is doing which is something that a lot of folks will do in the aftermath or wake of death of a loved one. Death is the great controller. I mean, you you want to get people feeling a sense of powerlessness. I mean, put them in the midst of what, of a loved one dying. I mean, it really does strip us of our sense of agency. So in this guy's grief, which he may also be experiencing as a loss of control, what he's doing is trying to compensate for it by controlling what he can. And right now, one of the ways that I think he's trying to control the environment he's in is by withholding service, by locking himself in, by drinking the alcohol that he can drink, and by saying no. And while that may appear petty, this is something that a lot of us seek in times of grief and in the context of death is what can I control? And it's not necessarily a conscious process, right? So he is in a precarious situation here because we essentially have to find a way to move him into a space where he cares about something, but nothing is likely to matter as much to him as the death of his daughter. So what we have to figure out is how to get him to turn his locus of control to Something that could potentially be useful not just to him, but also to the people around him and may be in honor of his daughter's name. That's going to be immensely hard to do, especially since he's currently drunk, so may not even be fully coherent here. Have you told anyone about this? Of course not. And who would I tell? And what good would it do now, eh? I just wish I paid more heed to my girl. I'm sure you do, man. It's a bummer sometimes that when death comes for somebody, you realize you should have cherished and been more present with them in the times that you had them. Which is really a lesson to us all. This is why I always say if there are people in your life that you appreciate and you want to spend time with, you should make the effort. And you should really be as present as you can in those times. Like what? Why did you lock yourself in here? My girl, Valena, is one of the Alessa's maids and she's trapped up there in the castle but the mayor won't send anyone for her. She's been my life since my wife passed on two years ago. Now she's dead, or soon to be. I don't care what happens to me or the village or anyone. Yes, but there's no possible way we can save your daughter if she is alive if you're blocking people from being able to repair the armor they need in order to suppress the threat. You could work to help save her, dude. I'm an old man. Everyone knows we aren't making it through the night. Or are you going to save us? I intend to try. I think you could save yourselves. Is that so? Hmm. <laughs> Maybe it's the drink talking, but you almost sound like you believe that. It'd do me the world of good to think maybe someone like you could go in and find her. Provided any of us live through the night. What about the militia, man? They need your help. If you look for Valena, I'll reopen the smithy and make some repairs for the militia. I can do that much. Oh, can you do it? But can you do it while I look for her? I'll do my best, man. Not good enough. Murdoch said the same damn thing. 
And I didn't believe him either. You were asking a great deal, you wretched little man. I want to promise. Morgan. Promise me that you'll look for her. That you'll bring her back to me if you can. If I can. Uh, look, man, I can promise you that I'll try. I can't promise you that I'm going to find her. I don't like giving false promises to people. Promises are just conceptual BS to an extent. That give people some abstract idea that like something is more concretely going to happen than if you didn't promise. Like My promise doesn't mean anything. It's literally just the honor system. I will try to find her. I'll accept that. It's something to hope for, at least. Oh, lovely. Shall we next begin rescuing kittens from trees? I'm about to Is drop more. promise we will not keep? Let's hope not. What's this? I said nothing to you, human. Right then. It seems I have some work to do relighting the forge, and I suppose I'll have to find some iron. Hmm. Maybe at the mill. Oh, Murdoch just better send his men here as soon as possible if I'm going to get to all these repairs and get them done by nightfall. If you need anything done, well, just let me know. I've got a lot to do now, so you'll have to excuse me. Um, the answer to your question, McSwarleton, is that it depends. But it's usually more indicative of the second thing. I'm about to drop Morgan and Sten out of here when we have to talk to people. They're great in the battlefield, but I tell you what, they are not helping me when I go in here to talk to these people. I don't really appreciate Morgan being as blunt as she is because it doesn't add to the layering of things that we have to do. I appreciate her directness, but her directness isn't like particularly sophisticated like it's not something where I hear what she has to say and I go oh good and Sten is kind of right there with her so if we're going to get people see the thing is in order to get people moving toward a common cause as, as much as we love the idea that we can just band together to protect each other for a global shared cause. That's not how humans work. It's just not. Every single human on the planet, elf, canary, otherwise, acts to some variation in self-interest. People do not do things if they do not see the benefit to doing it. So when you are trying to get people to band together for a common cause, one of the most important things to do is to help them see the way in which that cause is of direct benefit to them. And if people can't see that, they push against it. Because then it becomes not worth their time. As much as we like to believe that people are going to lend a helping hand, even people who go out of their way to help other people, that is often to some extent self-serving insofar as you feel good when you do it. Right? Like, there is always some level of self-servingness. And I'm not calling that selfishness. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying it's the nature of how all of us operate. Most of us can't be bothered with things we don't care about or if we're not made to care about them. So some people use shows of force to get people to care about things because they have to in order to survive it. But we have to get these people in a position where their own convictions are heard and validated so that they feel a sense of purpose in going along with us this guy has said to us very explicitly i need you to go look for my daughter that will give me enough hope to sit down and do the repairs for the militia that's good enough for me i don't need morgan coming in here and saying well i hope we break that promise because it's a bullshit promise yada yada 
that doesn't help anything because if this smith hears that and says you know what fuck you and then doesn't do anything now he's not helping anybody his act his autonomy is exerted in a direction that doesn't help anybody so as much as people like to thumb their nose at diplomacy it's an incredibly important skill it's very important to get people to find their sliver as it relates to the large pie so that they believe in what they're investing in and people don't just appreciate things because you want them to so i really i'm not kidding i am i am at a point where like i'm really considering getting rid of morgan and sten from the from the party here because i don't trust their tact when we're talking to these people Obligatory. I know it's a video game. I know that what they say probably doesn't have any actual impact on what the NPCs do, but I'm going to play this as realistically as I would. So before I get comments on YouTube that are like, Dr. Mick, it doesn't matter what Morgan and Sten say. You can keep them in your party. I'm trying to make a point here. I got to be careful about who I got with us. I must admit, it feels good to be up and doing something finally. There's no way I'm sobering up before morning, however. Yeah, great. Now he gets to do this when he's, uh, when he's drunk. Let's talk business. Right. I haven't got much, obviously, but I'll do whatever I can for you. All right. What do you got? Great sword, long sword, helmet. Soldier's home. Heavy chainmail gloves. Metal kite shield. Splint mail. I could buy these for Stin, although I don't know that's going to make that big of a difference. He really doesn't have much, does he? Uh, I'm inclined to sell a couple of these things just because I'm carrying too much. Plus, whatever I sell him, he can sell to other people. All right. Good shit. Also, I just want to say thanks again for watching this video. If you're watching on YouTube, thanks so much for taking time out of your day or night to watch this. And those of you that are here on Twitch, hanging out with me live... Thank you. I really appreciate all of you supporting my content in the way that you do. It means more to me than I could ever put into words. So thanks for following along with this. I'm really enjoying this, and I hope you are too. As a reminder, please don't spoil whether it's in the comments in YouTube or whether it's here in Twitch chat, and please don't backseat as well. Mods will remove what you say, um, and it's nothing personal. Just trying to keep it clean for people who haven't played the game before. It would be <laughs> right if his prices were lower while he's drunk and then they go up. Yeah. Well, it looks like Owen's finally doing the repairs we need. The damn fool is falling over a drunk and still manages to make smithying look easy. Good enough, I say. I'll inform Bantigan the militia is ready to fight. We'll give those bastards a welcome they won't soon forget. I'm going to try to prop this guy up. I'm not generally one for false bravado, but I, want, I need this guy to be tip-top shape here to inspire people. We're gonna win, brother. I hope you're right. We may just be village folk, but we're going to fight like there's no tomorrow. I still need to speak to Sir Perth. You'll find him and his men at the mill by the bridge, to the north. I have a good feeling about tonight. All right, let's go to the mill. All right. I've come up with one. A question that you can't answer. Are you talking to me? That's right. You think you're so smart. I've got an academic question that I bet you won't be able to answer. Oh, I doubt that. So tell me then. What was the name of Andraste's husband? This is a religious question, not an academic one. You're joking, right? A five-year-old could answer that question. Do you not know more than a child? I care nothing for your religion. 
and this game of yours is over. Oh, how well, the mighty have crumbled. Mm. Trying to connect a little bit. Swamp questions. <laughs> Man, these are some really weirdly built structures here, huh? Castle's cool in the background. All right. House. What's up, Darnell? Yes? What can I do for you? I have a letter for you from the Blackstone Irregulars. I knew this time would come. I should have listened to my wife. Don't sign that paper, she said. They might pay you a few sovereigns now, but they'll be back. Blast. I'll see you on the front lines, I suppose. Thank you, sir, for being cordial. I'm going to loot your house now. What are your feelings on Morgan as a person so far? That's a hard question for me to answer. We're still getting to know her. Um, I've given some analysis in some of the previous episodes, but um, I think Morgan is a pretty insecure person who fronts a lot of that insecurity with boldness and directness and sometimes shock value in order to keep people on their heels. But I also think that part of that is because the way that she was raised was not particularly conducive to good connections with people. All right, the Ballad of Aisley? The wind that stirs their shallow graves carries their song across the sands. Heed our words, hear our cry, the gray are sworn, in peace we lie. Heed our words, hear our cry, our names recalled, we cannot die. When darkness comes and swallows light, heed our words, and we shall rise. From the Ballad of Aisley, said to have been written after the Battle of Aisley, which ended the Fourth Blight, 520, Exalted. Alright, so we sent that guy where he needs to go. Let's go up here. What's this? A fish. Very weird. Okay. There is one thing I do not understand, Alistair. Just the one thing. About you, perhaps. Why the deception over your parentage? I'd figure you'd be the sort who knows all about deception. I do. And what use the deception might have had ended when King Kalen perished, did it not? Maybe. I guess I was sort of hoping that would go away. The truth does not go away. I didn't say it was a good fact. <laughs> I have to say, though, in a lot of ways, Morgan is not wrong. Morgan's evaluations of the world around her are pretty good. Her delivery is the hard part, and there is an important that is important. Like she does need to be mindful of her delivery. Who is this guy? Sir Perth. What's up, man? Greetings, Grey Warden. I am as relieved as Bantigan is to see you here. I must admit, I do not know how to address an elf in your position. I do not wish to be rude. That's cool. Uh, call me Mick, if you would. As you wish, and thank you kindly. I am Sir Perth, until recently in direct service of Arl Eamon of Redcliffe. For now, my charge is defending the village from these evil assaults. Would that I had chosen not to seek out the urn of sacred ashes. Perhaps I would have fended off whatever evil befell the castle. Or perhaps I would be dead. Ah, well. With a great warden aiding our defense, perhaps all is not lost. No use paying attention to what, what happened, man. Keep focusing on what you did do. Is there anything I can do? I have some questions for you, sir. 
Ask me whatever you wish. Or can I get some supplies? I'm not sure. Murdoch mentioned a blacksmith in the village, but I believe the militia is using everything he had. Beyond that, you might try the village store. It's locked up, but there may be items of use still within. I do not know. Corrine, thank you for the three months worth of tier one subs. I appreciate that. What about the tavern? Ugh. A fellow named Lloyd runs it. He refuses to close and evacuate to the Chantry. I suppose he might still have something to sell you. Though I wouldn't encourage dealing with a fool. He was a profiteer and nothing more. A lot of that going around for Elden right now, man. Uh, you said something about Nern? When the Isle fell sick, we were at a loss. Nothing worked to cure him and he just kept getting worse. Finally, our lesser Isold came up with a plan. The Urn of Sacred Ashes is a legendary artifact set to hold great healing powers. If found, it might save him. They say the followers of Andraste smuggled her ashes out of Tevinter and hid them in Ferelden. The urn's never been heard of since. We knights volunteer to seek it out. Few of us have returned. Many are still out there, unaware of what is happening here. Interesting. Corrine, thank you for the five gifted subs. That's super cool of you. I appreciate that, friend. Thank you for your support. What's the Arl sick with? We were never certain. He thirsted for water and then grew weaker and weaker. He brought in a mage, but even that did nothing. The Arlesa believed he was cursed and that we needed the power of Andraste herself or he would surely perish. Why did the Arlesa believe anyone would find the urn? The Arl once employed a scholar, Brother Genetivi. He had proof the urn was in Ferelden, or so I was told. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure either, Skog, what's supposed to happen with the urn. I guess we gotta find it and then figure it out. Can no one find the other knights and bring them back? Eventually, perhaps. <coughs> the ones I have here were those near enough to recall within the last few days. I only returned myself because I was passing by Redcliffe and heard the news of strange attacks. The knights left the castle, def castle defenseless. Not at all. A great number of soldiers remained in Castle Redcliffe. I wonder if they perished there and were transformed into these things. The thought chills my blood. As you wish. Um, is there anything I can do to help? We have sufficient armor and weapons, but my knights are too few to stand against the monsters without assistance. Perhaps you could approach Mother Hannah in the Chantry for some holy protection against these evil creatures. Otherwise, I do not know what else you could provide beyond your own talents. We're as prepared for the onslaught as we could possibly be, all things considered. Is there anything else you need? No, nothing comes to mind. If you have not spoken to the mayor, Murdoch, you should. His militia is far more in need of aid than we are. Ask me whatever you wish. Uh, what happened? Did I already say what happened here? You know about as much as I do. I returned a day before the attacks began, having heard strange rumors about the abandoned castle. I was the only knight to survive the first attack. Since then, I found others returning from the Arlesa's quest. Until we get to the source of this evil, though, I do not think it will stop. And I don't believe we will be enough. Anything more you can tell me about the quest for the urn? When the Isle fell sick, we were at a loss. Nothing worked to cure him, and he just kept getting worse. Finally, our lesser Isold came up with a plan. The Urn of Sacred Ashes is a legendary artifact set to hold great healing powers. If found, it might save him. They say the followers of Andraste smuggled her ashes out of two. We knights volunteered to seek it out. All right, As carry you wish, on. Grey Warden. Make a watch over you. Yeah, I don't think they are dark spawn. There's some sort of like uh, undead, like ah, zombies or like some shit. Home again, but with more undead. Yeah, I hear you, Alistair. I'm off. Um, let's go inside the mill. Letter, a note between wealthy paramours. Ooh. A collection of embarrassing personal communications between the spoiled wealthy and their objects of obsession. You are filthy. Beast. Such depravity I have never been forced to suffer. How words are so laden when they leave your lips is beyond decent imagining. Madame, 
I love you, Sir Ogle. Hope we get more of those. Uh, I'm not allowed to simulcast to YouTube, McSwarlton. That's still not allowed for partners. But no, I don't have any intention of doing that. Might play around with doing some TikTok live streams, but um, simul stream with Twitch, but no, not YouTube. I'm not allowed to. Alrighty. A landmark tree? No work. We are glad that you are here helping us. Perhaps you will make a difference. I hope so. Andraste's Grace. Small white wildflower commonly known as Andraste's Grace. Morgan would like that. to me seek out divine protection for the knights while Perth and the knights are ready to fight Perth thinks some kind of holy protection from the maker will boost his men's morale you should talk to mother Hannah to see if she's willing to help mother Hannah can be found in the chantry all right let's go do that let's go get them a, a little blessing blessing a blessing from the Lord God be praised What's up, Bella? Another doomed soul come to drown their sorrows here, I see. If you came here for a drink, you'll have to talk to Lloyd. He's got a vice grip on the spigots. I'm just here to keep the boys from mutiny. Keep the boys from mutiny. What do you know about that elf in the corner over there? Not much. He's very quiet. Says his name's Beric and he's here to meet his brother, but I think he's lying. He's a bit... creepy. How's business been? Not that it matters right now. What business? Without the castle soldiers, the only customers we have are local. And they're all in the militia with no money to spend. The few with any money are here, but it's not enough to justify working. Lloyd's a... greasy pig. And if I didn't need this job so badly, I... Don't care for Lloyd? I never cared for Job. He gropes me and pays me next to nothing. But I suppose it could be worse. Not like I've got many options. Uh, I could talk to Lloyd about that if it's safe. Only if it's safe for me to intervene. I don't need to white knight this shit if it's gonna make it worse for her. Word to the wise, okay? I don't need to be Mr. Savior Complex, go in here, talk to Lloyd, then make it worse for her. Like, this could be, she very well may need this for her livelihood. She may very well be making a conscientious decision to stay. It's not great that he gropes her, of course. But if we go in White Knight without her permission, without talking to her first, we potentially complicate things. I could talk to him, but only with your permission. No, no, that'll just make things worse. And that's very sweet, but I'll be fine. All right, so there we go. Why don't you leave? Well, no, I'll go. I see. Okay. What can you do? Girls like me don't get much choice if we don't want to join the Chantry. And it's too late to get married. Shouldn't you be there? Later on, yes. Lloyd will lock himself in the cellar, and I'll go to the Chantry. Are you fighting tonight? I am. That's good to hear. I didn't know that. I should go. Keep safe. Lloyd, stop groping her. Berwick, what's up, buddy? Yes. God damn it. Lloyd's watered down swill hasn't made you leave yet. He'd... Just ran right in the line of fire. Berwick. Not looking for company. Not even from a hel fellow elf. Fellow elf. Strange seeing a fellow elf here. And that's all we have in common. How do you know? What's that supposed to mean? Just wanted to chat, man. I'm not here to talk. Just leave me to drink, all right? I just want to be left alone. I said I'm not looking for company. 
I hear you're Berwick one more time. What? How did you know that? Uh, well, that's my name. Why? Just curious, is that a problem? It's not a problem. You just uh, took me by surprise. Didn't mean to startle you. Look, just because you're an elf doesn't mean we should be friends. I was just told to... I mean, just leave me alone. What were you told to do? Nothing. Nobody told me to do anything. Just because you're a Grey Warden doesn't mean you can go around threatening people. What's going on, man? If I... But I never... Oh, all right, I'll tell you. Just... Just don't hurt me. This is more than I bargained for. Look, they just paid me to watch the castle and send word if anything should change. But they never said anything about monsters. I haven't even been able to report anything since this started. I'm stuck, same as you, I swear. Who are they? A tall fellow. I forget his name. He, uh, said he was working for Hal. Arl Rendon Hal. He's an important man, Terran Logan's right hand. So I didn't do anything wrong. What are you supposed to watch the castle for? Just to report any changes. Honest. All I could send word about was the Arl getting sick. After that, monsters started coming from the castle. You know how this happened. Tell me what's up, man. I don't know anything about these creatures. When the Arl got sick, I got scared that people would think I was involved. But I swear I don't know anything about it. They sent me to watch. Maybe they knew the Arl would get sick. I don't know. How do I know you're telling the truth, big dog? Here. This is a letter from them. It has instructions and everything. Keep it. Do whatever you want with it. I just thought I was serving the king and making a bit of coin on the side. You have to believe me. I think you should help defend Redcliffe tonight. Fitting. Oh, all right. I'll do it. Thank you for your mercy. I won't forget it. Berwick, we need your eyes and ears in Redcliffe. Stay in the village, keep your head down, and watch the castle. Report any changes, and you'll be well paid. Man, Loghain. I told you all, he's really good, right? Like, he's good. He knows what he's doing. And... Putting an elven spy in Redcliffe to see if there's any changes at the castle. I mean, it's huge. You, it makes you wonder what it is that he was actually looking for, right? Like, because all if... Here's the here's the really cool thing about... Well, cool. It's kind of evil thing about what Loghain did there. You can use uh, vagueness to your advantage. So, when Loghain says, I want you to report change... That's very key. Because if Berwin says, what change are I, am I looking for? And Logan says, that doesn't matter. You report any changes. When you go there, you're going to get the lay of the land. You see anything different, you let me know. It means that he's going to report things that he may not even understand the significance of in the wide range of things. So um, the reason I'm willing to spare him is my belief is that he probably didn't quite know exactly what he was doing. He probably thought he was trying to help. Because people, again, don't see Loghain as evil. People believe in Loghain. People think that Loghain is trying to save Ferelden. That's the story. We have to be very mindful at all times. The clash between our own understanding of what happened and the general wider discourse. Because we have to assume that people are privy to the wide discourse, not the truth. So, in this case, it gives me the chance to give that guy the benefit of the doubt. Because I think he probably was coming from a good place. So, when I said, you're going to defend tonight, and he goes, alright, I'll do it. That shows me. That he's just wanting to help. He doesn't actually understand that Loghain is evil. And I actually should be careful... 
not to call Loghain evil. I don't know that Loghain is evil. I think his actions were not great. At the same time, there's a good chance that Loghain is acting in some way that he believes is in the best interest of Ferelden. Like, I'm not going to doubt his allegiance to the world. At least not yet. Well, killing him outright doesn't do anybody any good. Because if I kill him outright, that's a person I've lost. If he dies in the castle, that's not great. But also, he could lend his hand and help out. Like, it's a bit of a weird choice if I just decide to kill him right there. Because that's one man now that we don't have available to us. And numbers are going to be super important. Lloyd! Hello there, friend. Can't say we've ever met before. Stranger to the village, I take it. Haven't had many travelers lately. All this nonsense is bad for business. Bet you regret coming, yes? Um, Bet you regret coming in yet. I'll be leaving shortly anyway. Actually, what do you mean? Oh, you know, evil creatures, <laughs> impending doom, civil war. And the Earl's dead in the castle. Makes you thirsty, don't it? So, what'll it be? You are here to drink, I hope. I am not. I need some questions answered. Fine. Make them quick. Didn't you be helping defend the village? Why? When them creatures attack, I lock myself in the cellar, just batten the hatches and wait it out. What's the point in getting myself killed with all the rest of them? If that makes me a coward, then I'm a coward. Hey, at least you own it, man. Not gonna tell him he's gonna die now. All right, I should go. Right then. I don't think he's gonna be particularly useful to us. And now everyone who dies here. Uh, run upstairs. I can't. Uh, let's go to the chantry. Get the blessing. I think we should be good to go to the castle. Uh, now I'm looking for Sister Somebody. A mother you are hand. of elven blood and a stranger, yet you defend a home that is not your own. We are grateful for that. Um, I can't stand by while monsters attack the helpless. That's probably what she wants to hear. Not many in these modern days would honestly say the same. You are a man of worth, and the Maker will smile upon you. Allow me to introduce myself. I am revered Mother Hannah, head of this chantry which for the moment is a place of refuge for these poor villagers. They are terrified of tonight's attack, and I fear these walls will not keep them safe. What can I do to help with your task? Uh, Sir Perth needs holy protection for the knights. I have done all I can for them. I pray for them each night and seek the Maker's forgiveness for their sins before they face their deaths. What Sir Perth seeks is something that is not in my power to give. It's more of a gesture of symbol. It's I, I don't need you to actually get the maker to go in and jump into their armor. You're not praying hard enough then. <laughs> Can't you just bless them? Uh, what do you mean? Sapath believes that I can protect them against these creatures. A shield only the maker can provide. And that I withhold this power. Well, can't you just tell him the maker will watch over him? Morale is a powerful thing, you know. You mean you want me to let them think the Maker protects them in a real sense? I will not lie to them like that.
You know... <clears throat> you will generally find that uh, the higher up you go in uh, the organized chantry, so to speak, higher ups often know what the actual deal is. It is often the people on the ground who are really the like full-blown ideological folks. People up high that pull the strings kind of know the reality. Right? Like, oh, you want me to think the maker protects them in a real sense? Like, there are other people that we could talk to that I'm sure would believe that if they gave the blessing, that's what would happen. Now, I know that there's some lore around the fact that, like, there was a, there's some belief that the maker is, like, kind of wonky right now. Here's the thing. This is the, this is a tricky thing because when we're talking about an immediate need and the soldiers and the... Like, basically, the knights are saying that it would be really meaningful to have a symbolic gesture. I don't even know that they're specifically asking for guided protection. Maybe they are. That symbolism could be profoundly important. <coughs> it's the locket that a person has around their neck when they go into battle. At the same time, one thing that could be a potential blowback here is that if they do have a misguided sense of what her blessing is going to do, it actually may lead them to be very reckless. Like, you may actually have some of these knights make dumb decisions because they think that the maker is controlling or like into their armor, making them safer. And if we know that that's not actually true, right? Like we're working with two very unknown variables. Essentially, it's what do we want to do? Do we want to have do we want them to believe that they are blessed so that they have a more like hopeful sense of their abilities when they go into battle at the risk of them internalizing it to a point of making dumb decisions? Or do we want to be real with them at the risk of them being demoralized going to the battle in the first place? So like thoughts and prayers in a helpful sense. Sure, yeah, there are some people that legitimately find comfort in the sentiment of you have my thoughts and prayers. There are other people who hear that and go, knock it off that's the dumbest shit you've ever said to me because thoughts and prayers don't actually do anything but for some people the symbolic gesture is what matters ultimately here when we're trying to make this decision i need the knights to make it to the fight if one of them makes a bit of a dumb decision because they believe that the maker is infused in their armor so be it but as I always talk about on this stream, we have to work with known variables versus unknown variables. The known variable we have right now is that we've been told that a blessing from her would make a huge difference in how the knights engage in combat. And so that's what we're going to try to push for. If they think it helps them, that can be a big deal. And they have specifically requested it. You don't have to lie to them. You just have to go up there and do the symbolic gesture. I suppose their belief in the Maker's power could inspire them, but it just seems like trickery. Very well. If it keeps them alive, I will do what I must. I have a number of silver cast holy symbols. Tell Sapath that he can have them, and that wearing them will confer the Maker's protection. Now please, let me tend to these poor folk. I must do what I can, and I suggest you do the same. So interesting that she basically like gets to pick and choose where people are gonna find meaning from the maker. <coughs> like, nah, 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 nah. It's, it feels like trickery here, but you know these people who have dead relatives and no future ahead of them because their home has been decimated, we'll keep the maker in mind. I hear both Murdoch and Sir Perth are ready for nightfall. Excellent news. Very well. Luck be with you, my friend. I just want to check in with him real quick. All right, let's go tell Sir Perth or whatever the hell his name is. I got silver dollars for you, friend. Oh, I thought we had a crash there. I really thought we had a crash there. Oh, don't mind me, fellas. Just walking in front of your arrows. 
She does seem jaded. I mean, the harsh reality right now, it would make anybody question the Maker. I think it would be odd if people in the Chantry are just blindly following the Maker right now. Like, if you believe that the Maker is really in control here, like, this would be really demoralizing. This is a crisis of faith, I think, for a lot of people. It's like, why on earth would the Maker let this happen? The Knights of Redcliffe are ready to fight at your disposal. Uh, you said you wanted holy protection. Have you spoken to the revered mother? Has she offered anything? She has some holy amulets. If they are the same as the symbols worn by their priests, well, that would more than suffice. I'm glad I could help. I will send some men to collect the amulets. Please give my regards to Mother Hannah for seeing some sense at last. Um, is there anything else you no, need? Nothing comes to mind. If you have not spoken to the mayor, Murdoch, you should. His militia is far more in need of aid than we are. Carry on. As you wish, Grey Warden. Make a watch over you. Okay. I believe we have now done everything that we needed to do here. Uh, Redcliffe. Yeah. All right. Prepare for battle. Here we go. Mother Hannah's amulets have greatly bolstered my men's confidence. You couldn't have armed us with any better than our faith in the Maker. Happy to help, brother. I'm ready to make my stand. There is still time before the sun goes down. If you have not yet spoken to Murdoch, or if there is anything you have planned... Uh, no. I think we're ready to go. I've done everything I need to do. Good luck to you, then. And may the Maker watch over us all. Oh God. All right. Let's go walking corpse. Oh geez. Yes. Got you, Berwick. Right, how's everybody doing? Everybody's doing okay. So many. Stay here and guard the path. Come on, we need to hurry. All right, we're going. Come on. Uh, uh, uh. Let's check the level up real quick. Alistair. 
make you stronger. And let's give you this. Uh, Morgan, let's give you more willpower. Air shape, that seems useful. And me, I'm good to go. All right. <laughs> when do we find out the dragon's age? <laughs> Oh no! Let's go, in we go. I'm gonna try to get the aggro on all of them. Aggro! Ah. Yes, you. Shit. Yeah! So many. arrives and we survive the night we are victorious and though this victory came at great cost we must remember none of us would be here were it not for the heroism of these good folk beside me I thank you good sir truly the maker smiled on us when he sent you here in our darkest hour uh, there is much more to do Ben Tegan Surely these people deserve some small celebration, don't you think? There is time yet. Let us bow our heads and give honor to those who gave their lives in defense of Redcliffe. Now they walk with he who is their maker. Long may they know the peace of his love. I will remain silent. With the Maker's favor, the blow we delivered today is enough for me to enter the castle and seek out your Arl. Be wary and watch for signs of renewed attack. We shall return with news as soon as we are able. Now we've no time to waste. Meet me at the mill. We can talk further there. All right. Look at that. Not bad. Sten, what do you got, big dog? Oh, 
Okay. General store. Caitlin's. Wow, the general store is open now. Seems. We have made a worthy dent. I'm off. In quite literally the most confusing city layout I think I've ever been in. Ever. Here you stand. There's lamp oil in these barrels. Okay. Anybody here? No? Wind's home. Break open the lock. Oh, it's you. The one they're all talking about. Shouldn't you be out there celebrating with the rest of them? Go on, out! Use your help with the Darkspawn, man. If I wanted to fight Darkspawn, I'd have stayed in Orzammar. No thanks. Who are you? Name's Dwin, and this is my house. Private property, as they say. Yes, and I just broke your door down. All right, I'll go. Go celebrate or whatever it is you're gonna do. You won, right? You're a hero, or something. Why are you being weird about this? Never thought I'd survive that. Who cares what they were? I'm just glad they're dead. Broke into this guy's house and he's not even mad about it. Like literally I just broke in and he's just standing there. And apparently it's all good. Alright. Uh Entry ready, a tavern's good, smithy's good, house. I, I guess we could go follow up on the smithy. I want to see what he has to say. Maybe he feels a little bit better now. So we won the battle? If this is what war is like, with so many people hurt and dying, I don't want to think about what fighting the Darkspawn will be like. Van Tegan or Al Eamon will be calling for volunteers soon, won't they? They'll need an army to fight in the south now. I'll go when they call me, I guess. I'm going to get drunk first, though, if you'll excuse me. All right, man. You do what you got to do. You had a rough night. What's up, John? I'm still amazed we made it through the night in one piece and one. They'll be telling stories about this for years, I bet. Fighting's not over. We still have Darkspawn to battle, and if the Arl sends out the call, I'll be there for him. Commendable attitude, man. If you'll excuse me, I think I'll offer the Maker a bit of thanks for not choosing to be a wrathful god today. Good luck to you. The end is upon us. The dead rise, and foul magic spreads across the land. Repent your sins before death. Beg for the Maker's divine forgiveness. You repented your sins? I have. I have repented. Oh, Maker! Forgive me my sins! Forgive my fellow brothers and sisters! Look upon us with kindness as we are swallowed by the darkness! <laughs> That's good. Kill him, jeez. Please calm down, man. I... I don't mean to. I... I just need to tell everyone. They need to know. They need to repent before... before it's too late. I was too late for my wife. She died so horribly. 
But she... she was not repented. I need... I need to help everyone. To prepare. People look for answers. And this guy is struggling with the fact that perhaps there were forces beyond his control that led to his wife's demise. And so instead of allowing that to be the case, and sitting in the awfulness of that, he's redirecting the accountability to himself. And he's suggesting that because he didn't repent his sins, and perhaps his wife didn't repent her sins, that's why she died. You want that to be the explanation, that's all well and good, but the problem with that is that if it's going to affect your actions going forward, and you're going to sit here, and you're going to scare the shit out of people, and you're going to try to get them to do something that's really more symbolic than anything else, repenting for your sins isn't actually going to do anything to these people, unless the maker shows himself and says, literally apologize for all that you did, which I allowed you to do because I made you, because whatever. Like, all it's going to do is freak people out and make them anxious. I understand where this guy is coming from. He's hurting. He, want an he wants answers. He wants control. He wants other people to not have to experience the pain that he experienced. There are more effective ways to do that than to run around shouting that other people need to repent because they're doomed to the same fate that your wife was if they don't. That doesn't help this situation. It never helps this situation. It's more self-indulgent than it is anything else. So, let's figure out a way that you can help people that doesn't involve you shaming them or asking them to do something that's more of a symbolic gesture than anything else. Perhaps I could help you? Help me? There is no help for me. I just miss my wife so much. This is all so horrible. I, I think I just need to sit down. I need to collect myself. Please do. My husband and son are dead. What am I supposed to do now? I feel numb. Oh, look at this. Caravan down. Unfortunate news has arrived that the Dark Spawn have extended their incursion into areas previously thought safe to travel. A runner from a border caravan brings word that they unknowingly passed into infested territory and were being tracked by several unseen creatures. He was dispatched to seek help and does not know the fate of his fellows or the viability of the trade route. Sister Rana posts on behalf of her neighbors. The darkspawn incursions in the south have made for difficult communication even through official means. The relatives of the conscripts in Company East Hill have beseeched me to deliver word of their brothers and sons. I have no means to do so, but can point a traveler of stout heart in the proper direction of their recent engagement. To any who are able to find their loved ones, I offer what little silver they have been able to entrust to the board, as well as the sincerest gratitude of the Chantry. A runner sends this request from the Knight Commander Times. While the reports I have heard no doubt suffer from exaggeration, the observed creatures assaulting Redcliffe trouble me greatly. If we are to properly combat these unnatural agents and prevent their re reoccurrence, the mages bound to my service will require carefully prepared samples of flesh for study. Thereafter, should a deployment occur, we will be well briefed. If there are skilled warriors present, I would have them gather samples from any remaining creatures as close to the presumed source as possible. Chantry will reward this basic assistance with spiritual acknowledgement. If the request is exceeded, gold will be added, but the offer is limited. Okay. Sister Rana has heard reports of an imminent tragedy. Our runner has brought me dire news of a group of refugees fleeing the dark spawn. They have been cornered in unfamiliar ground, fighting for their lives. The Templars are necessarily occupied, and my own means are few and stretched. If someone of skill has the ability to deliver these people, I can only offer the honest gratitude of myself and the Chantry. Hopefully that will be enough for the rare person we need. The deep dark before dawn's first light seems at home. But okay, so we've got a board now. now the sun Let's go in here and see what's going on. Ooh, what's this? Maker's blessings upon you, Warden. Blackstone Irregulars box. Grease the wheels, my friend! 
I have a task that requires some tact and discretion, and I think you're perfect for the job. <coughs> the Blackstone Irregulars cannot survive without the patronage of the nobles, mages, and other groups who retain our services. Without work to continue, however, we have to ensure we have we have ensured that people are looking out for other for our interests. To that end, I ask that you make a trip to Denerim and pass on our appreciation to certain individuals. Return when you are done, and I'll see that you are rewarded. Alright. Go into the chantry and see what's up. You saved us. I can't believe we're alive. And it's finally over. Uh, what are you gonna do now? With mother and father both gone, I suppose they'll send us to an orphanage. Maybe separated. At least we're both alive. I won't forget what you did, though. Neither of us will. Thank you. Quite welcome. We should leave now, I suppose. There's a wagon taking us north, and I don't want to miss it. Farewell. I'm literally wearing the sword, so if she wanted to say something about it, she just said something about it. That's how I'm looking at it. You're a Grey Warden, right? Were you in Ostagar? In the Kokari Wilds? My husband and son went there to bring the Chant of Light to the Chastened. But I haven't heard from them since. Are you Jetta? I am. You've heard of me? Yeah, what the hell? I'm sorry to burden you with my mourning. May her be with you. The interaction is so weird. Good day. There are many gone who we must honor. But we must also remember those who aided us in our darkest hour. Good to see you again. Everything all right, man? So far. I'll be fighting Darkspawn soon enough. I don't look forward to it. With the Maker's luck, I'll live through it all to tell my grandchildren a tale or two. Here's to hoping you can do the same. Indeed. All right. Out we go. I love the, uh, I love following up with everybody here. Good. What's up, man? Good to see you in one piece. Do you have news of Elena yet? Not yet, man. Well, I'll give it some time. Now's the best time to go into the castle, though, and see for yourself. Remember, a promise is a promise. Find my Valena. Yes, That's indeed all I it want. is. Okay. I will look for her. That's what I told you I would do. You back? Repent your sins before death! Beg for the Maker's divine forgiveness! Did we not talk about this, man? I cannot. It is my sacred duty. Magic is everywhere. Everywhere! The time to repent has come! Find some place else to do it. Ah, another one of the damned. They are everywhere. Yes, sure. Yeah, you tell yourself that, big dog. Driving everybody crazy. Up we go. The tavern. And I'm off. Place is bustling. What's a dark spawn look like? Worse than those things we fought? No, 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 wait. I, I don't want to know. Okie dokie. If it isn't the hero of the day, what can I get you? See what you got. Right. I've got some supplies, too, in case you're interested. With the store closed down, it doesn't hurt to pick up some of the slack, eh? Yeah, I guess so, Lloyd. Um... Eh... And I've got a decent amount of these at this point. Although I suppose they're cheap enough that I could buy both of them. And... You've been out to the market. 
There's not much to be had. There isn't likely to be more any time soon, that's for sure. Well, it would seem... I admit, for a while, I didn't think either of us would survive. It's good to see you did. Good to see you too. Anything I can get you? Nah, I should go. Good luck go. to you then. All right. I just want to make sure we covered all our bases here. That's all. You know? If we go up here, we talk to my man, Van Tegan. About to go to that castle, man. That scary ass castle. Here's a thought. Let's put the tavern at the top of a cliff and let drunk people stumble home. Nothing bad could happen. No, nothing bad at all. Let's also put these boards here on to walk up and make it hard for people. All right, what do you got for me, Sir Perk? Uh, it is sad to think of how much death there has been here. But we have saved the village beyond all expectations. You have done well, my friend. I will remain here to guard the village and receive any fellow knights as they continue to return. At least until the castle is retaken. Kidoki, how do we know that that was everybody? Move along, friend. Very well. Thank you. Kidoki. Odd how quiet the castle looks from here. You would think there was nobody inside at all. But I shouldn't delay things further. I had a plan. To enter the castle after the village was secure. There is a secret passage here in the mill, accessible only to my family. Oh? That's convenient. Perhaps I should have gone into the castle earlier, but I could not leave the villagers. Maker's breath. Tigan. Thank the Maker, you yet live. Isolde. You're alive. How did you... What has happened? I do not have much time to explain. I slipped away from the castle as soon as I saw the battle was over. And I must return quickly. And I need you to return with me, Tika. Alone. Alone? We're gonna need a little more than that. What? I... Who is this man, Tigan? You remember me, Lady Isolde, don't you? Alistair. Of all the... Why are you here? They are Grey Wardens, Isolde. I owe them my life. Pardon me, I... I would exchange pleasantries, but... Considering the circumstances... Please, Lady Isolde, we had no idea anyone was even alive within the castle. We must have some answers. I know you need more of an explanation, but I... I, I don't know what is safe to tell. Tigan, there is a terrible evil within the castle. The dead waken and, and haunt the living. The mage responsible was caught, but still it continues. And I think Connor is going mad. We have survived, but he won't flee the castle. He has seen so much death. You must help him, Tegan. You are his uncle. You could reason with him. I do not know what else to do. Um, why has he got to go alone? For Connor's sake, I promised I would return quickly and only with Tigan. Promised? Whom did you promise? Something the mage unleashed. So far, it allows him and Connor and myself to live. The others were not so fortunate. It killed so many and turned their bodies into walking nightmares. Once it was done with the castle, it struck the village. It wants us to live, but... I do not know why. It allowed me to come for you, Tigan, because I begged, because I said Connor needed help. Uh, ooh, uh whoa. Do you think this evil could be a deem? I need more info, man. This seems wild. I... I do not know. Oh, Maker's mercy. Could it truly be a demon? I, I can't let it hurt my Connor. You must come back with me, Tegan. 
please. Tell me a little bit more about the mage you mentioned. He is an infiltrator, I think. One of the castle staff. We discovered he was poisoning my husband. That is why Eamon fell ill. Eamon was poisoned? He claims an agent of Terran Loghain's hired him. He may be lying, however. I cannot say. How do I get the sense you're not telling us everything? I... I beg your pardon? That's a rather impertinent accusation. Uh, not if it's true. An evil I cannot fathom holds my son and the husband hostage. King for help. What more do you want from me? Tigan, I do not have much time. What if it thinks I'm betraying it? It could kill Connor. Please come back with me. Must I beg? Uh, enough questions. We get... Boy. Oh. I mean, he's going anyway, but him going alone is really mm, suspicious. Like, when you try to isolate people out, that's usually not a good sign. Like, it, it's just, it's ominous inherently. Because we're stronger in packs. The king is dead, and we need my brother now more than ever. I will return to the castle with you, Isol. <gasps> Thank the maker. Bless you, Tegan. <gasps> Bless you. You didn't get yourself killed, man. What good's it gonna do? I'm not certain, to be honest. I cannot let Isolde return alone. Perhaps I can help Connor or Eamon. Perhaps this is really a trap, but this is my family. I must try. I have no illusions of dealing with this evil alone. You, on the other hand, have proven quite formidable. Isolde, can you excuse us for a moment? We must confer in private before I return to the castle with you. Please do not take too long. I will be by the bridge. Here's what I propose. I go in with Isolde, and you enter the castle using the secret passage. My signet ring unlocks the door. Perhaps I will distract whatever evil is inside and increase your chances of getting in unnoticed. What do you say? Uh, what am I supposed to do in there? I wish I knew. I don't know any more about this evil force than Isolde seems to. Sir Perth and his men can watch for danger at the castle entrance. If you can open the gates from within, they can move in and help you. I don't think there's anyone else who can help you. If you choose not to go, then it's up to me to do what I can. Here is my signet ring. It will open the lock on the door in the mill. Whatever you do, Eamon is the priority here. If you have to, just get him out of there. Isolde, me, and anyone else, we are expendable. Jeez. I mean, I appreciate the reality of the situation, man, but you're really about to throw your whole family under the bus. I mean, that's... Whew. It's a man who really cares about Ferelden there. Uh, Zerog, thank you for the Prime sub. Appreciate that. Uh, wow. Ooh. I'll do my best, man. You are a good man. The Maker smiled on me indeed when he sent you to Redcliffe. One fool plan on top of another. But I can delay no longer. Allow me to bid you farewell. And good luck. Oh, I don't know that I totally disagree with you there, Sten. Oi. myself in a cage once when I was a child for an entire day ah good times so 
going. Get away from me! alive out there? Yeah, that would be me. Wait, you don't look like the Arlesa's guards. Are you from outside the castle? Uh... Huh. I have no idea who this guy is. He's wearing mage's robes and he's covered in blood. I'll ask the... I gotta control this engagement because I don't know anything about this guy. I can't play this... I can't give this guy the benefit of the doubt. I have to... I gotta... I gotta be on the defensive here. I gotta control every engagement I possibly can. I'll ask the questions here, sir. I... Yes. I understand. Good. Who are you? My name is Jowan. I'm a mage Lady Isolde hired to tutor her son, Connor. Until they, uh, threw me into the dungeon here. Why? You don't know? I thought everyone knew. I poisoned Al Eamon. Oh shit, it was you, huh? What about all these walking corpses? I I know it looks suspicious, but I'm not responsible for the creatures and the killings in the castle. I was already imprisoned when all that began. At first, Lady Isolde came here with her men, demanding that I reverse what I'd done. I thought she meant my poisoning of the Arl. That's the first I heard about the walking corpses. She thought I'd summoned a demon to torment her family and destroy Redcliffe. She had me tortured. There was nothing I could do or say that would appease her. So they left me to rot. Why'd you poison the Arl? I was instructed to by Terran Loghain. I was told that Arl Aemon was a threat to Ferelden, that if I dealt with him, Loghain would settle matters with the Circle. You see, I'm a Malefica, a blood mage. You, a blood mage? Truly? I would never have guessed. A blood mage? Well, that isn't good. I dabbled in the Forbidden Arts, and they condemned me to death for it. I thought Loghain was giving me a chance to redeem myself. But he's abandoned me here, hasn't he? Everything's fallen apart, and I'm responsible. I have to make it right somehow. I have to. So, Terran Loghain himself hired you? Yes. When the Templars caught me, they brought me to Denerim to await execution. Eventually, someone came to see me, alone. It was the Terran. I'd seen paintings of him, so I knew. I thought he'd have me executed right there. But he said I could make up for my crime. He said I would be helping the country. I'm sure he did. Why did he say Arl Eamon was a threat? He only said that Harl Eamon was dangerous to the nation. Why wouldn't I believe Terran Loghain? That is fair. I believe him. Remember, we can't go off of our truth. We have to go off of the general narrative. Terran Loghain is a generally respected person. He was seen as a friend of the king. I mean, like, it would make sense why when Terran Loghain showed up and said to this mage, I will help you atone, if you do this thing for me, that his immediate thought would be, okay, I can trust him. It wouldn't be, oh, this is a guy who turned his back on everybody at Ostagar. So I actually believe him when I say that. Why are you so eager to make things right? I'm not allowed regrets. I've made a stupid mistake at the circle, and now I've made an even greater one. I'm not a bad person. There's no reason for you to believe me, but I'm not. I have to make up for what I've done. I have to try. Give him a lot of credit for his self-awareness here. Right? There's no reason for you to believe me. That's fair. That's good on his part. Like, his ability to have some self-insight and empathize a little bit with what my experience of him is, it's good. It puts him in my favor a bit. Why did Arlesa need you to mate? Why did she need a mage to tutor her son? Connor had started to show signs. 
Lady Isolde was terrified the Circle of Magi would take him away for training. Connor? A mage? I can't believe it. She sought an apostate, a mage outside the Circle, to teach her son in secret so he could learn to hide his talent. Her husband had no idea. Lord. Oh, man. Oh, man. How much magic did you teach him? Some. But he's still very young. He can barely cast a minor spell, never mind something more powerful. At least not intentionally. I have thought about it, and it's possible Connor could have inadvertently done something to tear open the veil. With the veil to the Fade torn, spirits and demons could infiltrate the castle. Powerful ones could kill and create those walking corpses. Man, I don't know. That sounds so convenient. Like, what a... Uh, man, there is a part of me that's cynical because I don't know this guy from Adam. Like, this... If, if I was going to tell a really good story, like, if I was going to Palpatine my way through this, I poisoned Arleem, and I was teaching the... the Arl's son magic, and nobody was allowed to know of it. There's a chance that because he's inexperienced, he would have inadvertently pierced the veil. Ah, uh, this doesn't sound like common knowledge. This doesn't sound like something that's happened in all sorts of places. Like, I don't hear of like, oops, pierce the veil again. We had another one. Oh, geez. The, these silly mages with their inexperience piercing the veil. I don't know. It just, mm, something about it just doesn't doesn't sit well with me. I mean, he could be telling the truth, but... Oh... Uh, Arl even had no idea. No, she was adamant that he never find out. She said that he'd do the right thing, even if it meant losing their son, and that infuriated her. Why would she be frightened of her son becoming a mage? Because he would be taken away, forever. A mage cannot inherit a title. Even the son of a powerful Arl. She's also a pious woman. Her son having magic was humiliating. I see. I never meant for it to end like this. I swear. Let me help you fix this. I say kill the mage. He cannot be trusted. He doesn't need to die, surely. I say this boy could still be of use to us. But if not, then let him go. Why keep him prisoner here? Hey, hey, let's not forget he's a blood mage. You can't just set a blood mage free. Better to slay him. Better to punish him for his choices. Is this Alistair who speaks, or the Templar? I'd say it's common sense. We don't even know the whole story yet. Give me a chance, please. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Tell me exactly what you're going to do to make things right. I, well, I tried to save anyone still up there. There must be something I can do. And after that, what happens? Afterwards? I assume I'll be arrested, or executed, or whatever people like me get. I'm tired of running from the circle. I need to account for what I've done. Oh, God. Oh, man. I just don't have... I just don't have the context, man. what extent do I want to take this guy at his word? Like, this is a moment where I'd be like, you stay right here. I'm going to go ponder in the corner for a minute. I could let this guy go. I could let him out of the cage. And then maybe he's helpful. But maybe this dude is evil as shit and he pierces the veil even more and he brings more people in here and he's just this, like, overlord, awful piece of shit asshole guy who just wipes us out I mean, that is very plausible or he's true to his word he really feels terrible about what he did he wants to be held accountable for what he's done 
and he's willing to sacrifice himself. I have a hard time believing anybody who claims to be that altruistic. This guy is in a prison cell and is probably willing to say whatever he needs to say to get out. I don't know the circumstance. How did he even get in there? Why were those undead attacking him? Like, oh man. <coughs> Now that said, if what he is saying about Connor is true, there could be some very real leverage here if this guy joins our party. Like this guy could be a point of connection here where Connor's like, oh shit, I recognize this dude. I just, oh man, I just don't know. I don't know. I feel like he's more useful to me alive and in the cell than he is alive and dangerous or dead. I just don't know that I can trust removing him out of here. What if I just let, so if I let you I'd go? I'd stay and try to help if I could. Perhaps I can help deal with whatever's been unleashed here. A little late. I don't think it will redeem me, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't try. So one thing that I could do, and I realize like this isn't real life, this is a video game, but if this was real life, one of the things that I could do here is I could bluff. Like I could just basically say to him, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I'm going to leave you in the cell. And see how he reacts to that. If he becomes legitimately distraught, and he's sad, and he, and he gets upset by that in like a vulnerable way gives us some good information if he immediately gets defensive and nasty and shitty because he gets kind of like inflamed with rage grabs the bars and gets all ah! right and it made a good decision I have all the power here I don't believe you I'm not surprised. So, what now? Well, he's good with the he's good with the validation though. I think you're going to stay in yourself for now. And I will wait. If you change your mind, I will be here. You don't have any choice, big dog. Blood magic, the forbidden school. Foul and corrupt are you who have taken my gift and turned it against my children. Transfigurations, 1810. The ancient Tevinters did not originally consider blood magic a school of its own. Rather, they saw it as a means to achieve greater power in any school of magic. The name, of course, refers to the fact that magic of this type uses life, specifically in the form of blood instead of mana. It was common practice at one time for a magister to keep a number of slaves on hand so that should he undertake the working of a spell that was physically beyond his abilities, he could use the blood of his slaves to bolster the casting. Over time, however, the Imperium discovered types of spells that could only be worked by blood. Although Lyrium will allow a mage to send his conscious mind into the Fade, blood would allow him to find the sleeping minds of others, view their dreams, and even influence or dominate their thoughts. Just as treacherous, blood magic allows the veil to be opened completely so that demons may physically pass through it into our world. The rise of the Chance of Light and the subsequent fall of the old Imperium has led to blood magic being all but stamped out, as it should be, for it poses nearly as great a danger to those who would practice it as to those, or as to the world at large, from the four schools. Tvitisi? My first enchanter, Josephus. Seems pretty sophisticated to pierce the veil here and let the undead come out. I just, it's weird that, like, we would look at that and say, oh, a novice is capable of that. I, I mean, I don't know enough about it, but damn, man. Apostates. It is not uncommon for the neophyte to mistake apostates and maleficarum as one and the same. Indeed, the Chantry has gone to great lengths over the centuries to establish that this is so. 
The truth, however, is that while an apostate is often a maleficar, he need not be so. A maleficar is a mage who employs forbidden knowledge, such as blood magic and the summoning of demons. Whereas an apostate is merely any mage who does not fall under the auspices of the Circle of the Magi, and therefore the Chantry. They are hunted by the Templars, and quite often they will turn to forbidden knowledge in order to survive. But it would be a lie to say that all apostates begin that way. Historically, apostates become such in one of two ways. They are either mages who have escaped from the Circle, or mages who were never part of it to begin with. This latter category includes what we tend to refer to as hedge mages, those with magical ability out in the hinterlands who follow a different magical tradition than our own. Some of these hedge mages are not even aware of their nature. Undeveloped, their abilities can express themselves in a variety of ways, which the hedge mage might attribute to faith, or will, or to another being entirely, depending on his nature. Some of these traditions are passed down from generation to generation, as with the so-called witches of the Kaizen Wilders or the shamans of the Avar Barbarians. No matter how a mage has become an apostate, the Chantry treats them alike. Templars begin a systematic hunt to bring the apostate to justice. In almost all cases, justice is execution. There is some overriding reason the mage should live, the right of tranquility is employed instead. Whether we of the Circle of Magi believe this system fair is irrelevant. It is what it is. From Patterns Within Form by Halden, First Enchanter of Starkhaven, 880 Blessed. Yeah, I think we leave him in the cage for now. I don't think it hurts anything to do that. I'm off. We're going to tease him a little bit by opening all of the other cages. Isle of Filth. Bodies down here. Is everybody here dead except for that guy? Oh, there you go. Shit, friends. Fire crystal. It's not really of much use to me. Not used to me. Gather your party and venture forth. Yes. Even if I were innocent and you left me in the cage down there, I'd be upset. Like, freaking out. Don't leave me. Yeah, I mean, I could see him being afraid. I mean, maybe he's a bit safe with those metal bars, but... I mean, his reaction, one of being empathic towards us, is very... I mean, I, I give him credit for that. It's just hard to know. We just don't know enough about him to know if what he's saying to us is true. And so if we leave him down there, and we get to the other people that we need to get to, Perhaps we get a better story and we can make a more informed decision about whether to let him out or not. Regardless, he did poison the Arl. By orders of low gain aside, like, that's still not great. And for the people of Redcliffe, it would make sense why they want him in prison for that. Nice try. And I hear you. It would be scary to be down there, for sure. This is the beauty of this game. What I love about this game, maybe even more than any of the other playthroughs we've done, is this game is loaded with gray areas. 
there are no black and white answers to a lot of this stuff, and it makes for much more interesting conversation fodder in my mind. I absolutely love the depth and complexity of this game. Makes total sense, Kareen. Makes total sense. Niagara. Alright. Save after every conflict here. Yes. Oh shit. Oh sh we gotta fight shades? Oh man. Oh man, these things are so powerful. Oh boy. History of the Chantry, Chapter 2. When the prophet Andraste and her husband Maphereth arrived at the head of their barbarian horde, Southern Tevinter was thrown into chaos. The Imperium had defended against invasions in the past, but now they stood without the protection of their gods, with their army in tatters and their country devastated by the blight. Many felt that the timing of the invasion was yet another of the Maker's miracles in Andraste's campaign to spread his divine word. Andraste was more than simply the wife of a warlord. After all, she was also the betrothed of the Maker. Enraptured by the melodic sound of her voice as she sang to the heavens for guidance, the Maker himself appeared to Andraste and proposed that she come with him, leaving behind the flawed world of humanity that he created. In the wisdom, or in her wisdom, Andraste pleaded with the Maker to return to his people and create paradise in the world of men. The Maker agreed, but only if all of the world would turn away from the worship of false gods and accept the Maker's divine commandments. Armed with the knowledge of the one true God, Andraste began the exalted march into the weakened Imperium. One of the Maker's commandments, that magic should serve man rather than rule over him, was his honey to the souls of the downtrodden of Tevinter who lived under the thumbs of the Magisters. Word of Andraste's exalted march, of her miracles and military successes spread far and wide. Those in the Imperium who felt the old gods had abandoned them eagerly listened to the words of the Maker. Those throngs of restless citizens that destroyed temples now did so in the name of the Maker and his prophet Andraste. As Maphareth's armies conquered the lands of southern Tevinter, so did Andraste's words conquer hearts. It is said that the Maker smiled on the world at the Battle of Valerian Fields, in which the forces of Maphareth challenged and defeated the greatest army Tevinter could muster. The southern reaches of the mighty Imperium now lay at the mercy of barbarians. Faith in the Maker, bolstered by such miracles, threatened to shake the foundations of the Imperium apart. Of course, the human heart is more powerful than the greatest weapon, and when wounded, it is capable of the blackest of deeds. From Tales of the Destruction of Thetis by Brother Genitivi, Chantry Scholar. Love it. I sure hope it's cool that I read all of those because uh, you can strap in because I'm going to read all of them <laughs> as we come across them. I like getting all that juicy lore, you know? Armory. Oh, of course I can't unlock that. Why would I be able to unlock that? Oh, shit. Man. A lot of enemies. This 
guy's strong. Tank, dude. It is too much. I'm off. Now we loot. I actually really like games that make bodies disappear after you loot them. Sometimes it hurts with immersion a little bit, but it's very helpful. Oh, we got some Mabari in here. Why are these Mabari hostile to us? Job team. Yes. I'm going. Oh, I can give dog Lambo. All right, cool. Charred corpse. Iron. Give my doggo a treat when we get back. Fire crystal. We'll probably sell that. Oh. Okay. Well. Uh, okay. I'm gonna need to be a little more careful, huh? <laughs> Thank God that didn't just sever me in half. Main hall door. Oh, hello. they die when all of us are on one yeah, at the yeah, same time. Fine. What did I tell you? Stuff. Huh. Sir Elixir of Grounding. Ooh, what have we here? 
A little basement. Basement cellar. Maybe we go to the main hall. Seems we have options here. Main hall can't unlock to the main hall, so I guess we gotta go into the basement. All right. Basement we go. Chest I can't open. A lot of those. Steel bracers. Large flawed natural crit. Another love letter. Yeah. My darling Reginald, I burn for you. And because of you, please use the enclosed tincture if our love is to endure. Sari. This will be fun to have. Update over time. Pile of junk. Splint mail gloves. We're going to give those to Sven. I keep calling him Sven every time, man. Sten. I'll give him to Sten. There you go, buddy. Unlocked Redcliffe Castle. Oh shit! All right, we are in the main castle foyer. More cheese. Well, all right then. Oh shit! All right, up we go then. Oh! Oh boy! All right. Uh, bad thing. Baby, I'm getting drunk on poultices, I can tell you that. for me. Lame. All right. All right. Well, that was uh, something. I think before we go into the main castle, that's probably a good place for us to end for the evening. So I just want to say to all of you who came out on YouTube to spend some time with me and to enjoy the story as it continues on, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Make sure you leave a thumbs up on your way out. Follow all the links in the description. And leave a comment if there's something about this part that you liked or didn't like. I really appreciate all of your comments. I read them all. I don't respond to all of them, but I do read them all. Uh, and you all have been very kind so far through this playthrough, so thank you very much. Uh, many people have been asking in the comments if I intend to play Dragon Age 2 or Dragon Age Inquisition. Depending on how well this goes and how I'm feeling at the end, uh, they are certainly uh, possibilities. So I will keep you posted as we get closer to the end of Dragon Age 1 of whether we will continue into those games or whether we'll do something else. But as always, thank you so much for taking the time. Come hang out with us on uh, live on Twitch at some point if you like. If you're binging the series right now because the whole series or most of the series is available to you, I will see you in part seven. For now, thank you so much for taking the time to watch part six. I'll catch you on the next one.